o'clock. All right. Well, oh, good evening. And uh, welcome to the uh, Grand Lodge Minnesota's webinar series. Uh, this evening we have um, a talk about Demones and the religious philosophy of Freemasonry. And I apologize, I probably butchered that first word. De Deism, yes. Deism, thank you. I I should have asked beforehand, but that is what it is. We'll um, find out. <laughs> <laughs> as uh, we've said before, these are uh, not tiled meetings, so please be sure to govern yourselves accordingly. Uh, the sessions are recorded. Please keep yourself on mute uh, while during the session. Uh, if you do need to unmute yourself, you can use the space bar to do that temporarily. The uh, chat feature, please use that to send in your questions. We will be sure to leave time at the end to cover that. We will have a poll that opens up about five minutes or so before the end. Uh, please be sure to submit that before you leave. And the recording should get up on the Grand Lodge uh, YouTube site uh, in the next couple of days. Just depends on when I get a chance to, to, get, a, to get it uploaded. Uh, we have, this is the first part, as you saw earlier, of this series. Uh, there's two more parts to this. Uh, and then, um, most worshipful, uh, Ralph will be uh, answering some questions in a Q&A session in May, and then we've got a couple other interesting uh, sessions coming up here uh, the, uh, in, in May. Uh, we, as we've advertised before, we are doing the show and tell challenge. Uh, you need to answer uh, the question, what are more of the questions in some format, video, essay, poetry, art, uh, and submit it into the um, team for review. The link is at the bottom of, at the bottom there. Also, we have the Grand Lodge Mentoring Committee. Uh, we'll be uh, putting on a seminar both in person and online on the 1st of May about jumpstarting your mentoring program. Uh, please go visit the Grand Lodge website. Uh, either use the URL here or you can find it on the calendar and go ahead and submit your RSVPs. Uh, as we've asked before, there are we, we're looking for more people to do some presentations. So if you're interested, please uh, reach out to the to the mentoring committee on the email address or the phone number here. And without further ado, I will turn this over to uh, Most Worshipful Brother Terry. Most Worshipful, it is all yours. I'm going to stop share, and you should be able to. All right. Very good. There we go. go up here to this and um, get over to uh, how do I move things over there we go to slideshow and from the beginning well my brothers a uh, joy to be with you tonight uh, this is the first of uh, three parts of a paper that was written uh, almost two years ago and uh, has been submitted to the Ars Quarter Coronati, and uh, I'm told will be published in the uh, uh, yearbook for this coming year, 22. Uh, at least that's the plan. The uh, paper is titled Deism, the Faith of Our Founders and the Religious Philosophy of Freemasonry. And to a great extent, that will be the out of the, uh, of the uh, presentation that I'll give you in these three parts. Um, <clears throat> I am a uh, past Grand Master of Masons of Minnesota, but more importantly for this paper, I am uh, a United Methodist minister who has uh, done a, quite a bit of study on religion and masonry over the years, and uh, it's uh, a joy to be able to present this paper and uh, share some things that uh, maybe will reawaken some understanding about our craft and uh, a little bit about the religious philosophy of Freemasonry as I understand it. <clears throat> Begin with a quote. Um, Enlightenment was the desire for human affairs to be guided by rationality rather than faith, superstition, or revelation. A belief in the power of human reason to change society and liberate the individual from the restraints of custom and arbitrary authority all backed up by a worldview increasingly validated by science rather than by religion or tradition. This is from uh, a book entitled The Enlightenment by Duranda Outram, 
written about 15 years ago. And it's probably one of the best statements I've ever found about what the Enlightenment era was and um, its influence and uh, why it came into prominence. We're going to discuss that in some detail tonight uh, at the opening, as the opening part of this session. We've often heard it said that Freemasonry is religious, but not a religion. Uh, is that true? And in what sense is it true? As recently as 1980, uh, the Roman Catholic Church uh, in Germany put out a broadside against Freemasonry that accused Freemasonry of being deist and therefore outside the pale of any consideration of the Catholic Church for recognition. So then how did the religion in which all men agree, whereby Masonry becomes a center of union and the means of conciliating true friendship among persons that must have remained at a perpetual distance come to be? And how has it influenced what we practice today? These are some of the questions that we're going to share uh, over this session and the next couple of sessions, and uh, hopefully uh, give you some, uh, some, some things to think about, um, and then hopefully try to answer some of your questions as we go along. The synopsis of these uh, three presentations, I'll attempt to trace the development of the religious philosophy or craft, see if it was influenced by the religious practice of our early founders, and try to understand its significance on early Freemasonry and how we practice it in this modern era. Now, the modern era, of course, of Freemasonry is from 1717. Uh, how, however, Freemasonry has been around far much longer than that, and that's an entirely different talk. But uh, essentially, we're talking about modern Freemasonry as we know it, essentially coming from the Premier Grand Lodge of, of England, uh, United Grand Lodge of England today, and um, a Freemasonry as it's understood around the world in its regular uh, orientation. Um, we're going to begin uh, with uh, asking a little bit about the development of uh, religious philosophy from the 13th to the 18th centuries, noting a series of persons who were instrumental in the development of the Enlightenment, which gave rise to deism. Uh, you may or may not be familiar with the term deism, and as we go along, hopefully we'll be able to explain that to you. It's important to remember that prior to the Enlightenment, Thomas Aquinas, perhaps one of the greatest church fathers of the early, uh, of the late Middle Ages, saw human nature and the natural world infused by grace. His major work, Summa Theologica, was uh, said, grace does not destroy nature, it perfects it. The Catholic Church today, uh, for the most part, practices Thomism. That is the religious uh, philosophy that uh, was pretty much grew up out of the writings and teachings of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, part of that uh, teaching has to do uh, just with, uh, in the Catholic Church, with things such as birth control. Why does the Catholic Church take a uh, significant uh, stand against it. And it's based on uh, the idea of natural religion as proposed by Thomas Aquinas, that uh, only those things which are um, uh, God given in terms of uh, natural uh, are to be approved and those things with interventions uh, are not to be. And so, um, uh, birth control is considered to be an intervention in one of the most significant aspects of uh, life and procreation. Professor Robert Tyler stated, through this grace, for Aquinas, like most, uh, like, unlike most of us, the distinction between the natural and the supernatural was not nearly so strong, which is simply a way of saying that uh, there was a belief that uh, God was reflected not only in nature, but God's grace was reflected through it and in it, and that we as human beings are uh, perfected the more we, be, we come into a, an alignment with uh, the understanding and the uh, knowledge of this uh, natural law through human nature. 
Martin Luther, <clears throat> no doubt, marks uh, the greatest theological rift with the Catholic Church. And of course, that begins historically in 1517. He would, assist, he would assist to divide faith and reason, religion and tradition, an individual conscience and ecclesiastical authority. And uh, it would be his work that would begin the first major challenge to the Catholic Church, which in fact had influence upon the Enlightenment. We'll see that more significantly in the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, it is posited that a major cause of the Enlightenment was the Thirty Years' War of 1618 to 1648. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of what the Thirty Years' War was, but it comes directly out of the uh, Protestant and Catholic divide, which uh, was started by Martin Luther, uh, or it wasn't actually started by him, but uh, in a sense uh, first accomplished by him successfully. And um, Many, many historians believe that the single most significant event to give rise to the Enlightenment was the Thirty Years' War, which became the first continent-wide war enveloping Germany and most of Central Europe. Causes included rival German princes holding more power than the Holy Roman Empire, Emperor, and in Germany, uh, in, and in Germany, the religious divide of proud Protestant North and Catholic South with the resulting power vacuum. The Thirty Years' War comes to an end with the Peace of Westphalia uh, only after it caused severe depopulation. Uh, in Germany, it was estimated that uh, almost 8 million died uh, during the war, and uh, more than uh, half of the population, it's been estimated almost two thirds died. The princes wrestling, wrestling power from the Holy Roman Empire, these are some of the uh, results and Germany being divided into more than 360 states. Religious wars would end and the rise of nation states would begin with a greater religious tolerance. And so it is out of this event that when we talk about uh, religious tolerance and we look at the aspects of uh, religious philosophy developing that uh, many historians go back to this event and say this was a single greatest cause of the Enlightenment fear, which uh, brought about uh, uh, not only Freemasonry, but uh, nation states and uh, modern uh, nation building as we know it today. Thomas Hobbes, an English philosopher, he believed that religion should be treated naturalistically, not as a set of truths or moral guidelines handed down by God but a human creation rooted in psychology and social life. He would publish his, uh, his most significant work, Leviathan, in 1651, noting only agreement and social contracts with other human beings can make life better. His arguments uh, about metaphysical and spiritual reality uh, moved meta metaphysical and spiritual realities farther away uh, from uh, in, in importance uh, from uh, the uh, uh, from uh, where the church was at, and uh, he is uh, the first of the English philosophers that's uh, most uh, significantly given and looked at as uh, moving it uh, more towards a, a, a scientific view a much more uh, naturalistic view of the world without uh, necessarily uh, looking at God uh, as uh, the significant uh, uh, part of uh, how um, lives should be ordered. Of course, during this period of time, uh, we have the, uh, a lot of scientific developments. Nicholas Copernicus, who postulated a heliocentric world, not geocentric, uh, which is not is to simply say, a, a world in which uh, the earth revolves around the sun rather than the other way around. Galileo Galley, uh, father of the observational astronomy, modern physics, scientific mission and method and of modern science. It would be essentially his uh, teachings related to uh, hypothesis, uh, an experiment, and then uh, a conclusion which would cause the uh, current uh, recognized scientific method of, of use even to this day. 
Isaac Newton, of course, is described, was described as a natural philosopher who said the universe was guided by natural laws. Uh, natural laws, uh, that is, uh, laws that uh, did not necessarily have to involve God. Um, Isaac Newton, of course, and uh, as many of the great uh, scientists of the uh, English period were members of the Royal Society. René Descartes, a uh, French philosopher, mathematician, and scientist, credited with the first modern philosopher who asked, how do we know? And if you remember back to your college philosophy classes, uh, the statement, I think, therefore I am, is the beginning of knowledge, according to Descartes. He was considered the founder of 17th century rationalism, which regards reason as the chief source and the test of knowledge. This enlightenment ideal of reason naturally asks the philosophical question of religion. How do we know? And uh, of course, that is the uh, significant question. How do we know uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, how life should be ordered? Uh, and uh, what, uh, uh, what should govern our lives, what should govern nations. Uh, and uh, Descartes uh, is uh, uh, significant, uh, makes significant contributions. We now get to uh, Edward Lord Herbert of Sherbury, a name you have probably not heard, but he's often called the father of English deism. He never used the word deist or deism in his writing. Uh, as the term generally uh, became a word of derision for someone who believed, who is believed to be an atheist or outside the Orthodox Christian belief. He is credited with propounding the five classical points of deism. And um, uh, his writings and his work uh, were looked at uh, by uh, almost all of those in the deistic movement as being the founding of it. However, uh, we need to make some distinctions about his work and the work of uh, deism and what it looked like, uh, more especially in the period up to the founding of our uh, Grand Lodge. The five classical points of Herbert Cherbury. There is one supreme God. He ought to be worshiped. Virtue and piety are the chief parts of divine worship. In other words, uh, how we live and uh, uh, how we order our lives. We ought to be sorry for our sins and repent of them. And divine goodness dispenses reward and punishments both in this life and in the life to come. Uh, if you were to ask yourself, uh, uh, what, what's so significant about the, these principles of uh, classical deism, I think uh, most of us would not uh, find difficulty coming from our own religious backgrounds, whatever they might be, to say that um, these points uh, seem pretty uh, basic, uh, more especially as we think of the Christian faith, but uh, of uh, most religions uh, in terms of belief in God. Uh, uh, acknowledging uh, reverence for God. Uh, that reverence uh, speaks to, about how we live and uh, acknowledging uh, our faults and then uh, acknowledging that uh, there's some sense of uh, reward and punishment for the, the, the way we live and what we do. The question though that is raised is, uh, are these five classical points representative of Freemasonry as we practice it today? Uh, this deism of Herbert uh, belongs to the early period in its development. Deism was generally tolerant in this early period. Later, it became a radical enemy of Orthodox religion and religious revelation. And we'll explain a little bit more about that. But the question I would raise is the first question, are these classical points representative of Freemasonry as we practice today? And I would argue that indeed they are. Um, and I could go into great detail relative to our, uh, our landmarks in relationship to them, 
but um, I'm not going to do that right now in order to continue on with this, uh, this discussion. Norman Torrey, uh, who wrote about Voltaire and the English deists in 1930, gave this definition of deism. Deism means the adoption of a natural religion based on common ideas of morality, including the worship of a supreme being whose laws are plain and engraved in the hearts of all men, as opposed to Christianity with its supernatural doctrines and religious duties. We'll go into a little bit more detail about that, but uh, this was uh, the distinction that he looked at uh, and uh, represents uh, that latter part of the movement of deism in terms of the distinctions that it made. Uh, which made it uh, so intolerant uh, of many things related, for example, to the Christian faith. For Lord Herbert, there was not a denial of the Christian faith, only the necessity of using rational or enlightenment uh, principles to discover universal, as he called them, universal innate ideas. Uh, those five classical points, uh, he believed, were in fact uh, uh, rationally come to by any rational person and uh, represented uh, not a denial of the place of a supreme being and uh, a creator, but recognized that um, we have uh, responsibilities and uh, uh, rights and responsibilities uh, in relationship to how we live in this life and how we treat one another. John Locke uh, is perhaps considered uh, one of the greatest English philosophers. He was a physician actually by training. Under Locke and Newton, Deus turned to a natural theology, to arguments based on experience and nature, and often cited the cosmological argument and the argument from design. These arguments for the existence of God claim that all things in nature depend on something else for their existence, that is, are contingent and the whole cosmos must therefore itself depend on being on a, on a being which exists independently or necessarily and is beyond knowing or comprehending. From this will come the first principle of deism, at least in its uh, later period of time, God exists as the creator of the universe and all that's in it. And that the supreme being is unknowable, omniscient, and incomprehensible. Um, consequently, uh, God is removed from, uh, from most common life uh, by, by the fact that uh, he is unknowable. Uh, uh, he knows all things, yes, but we cannot comprehend, comprehend his mind. This is often called the first principle of theism. Uh, so then we might ask ourselves, what was deism, and uh, in, at least as most people use it in throwing its, uh, uh, its religious philosophy at Freemasonry. Deism is commonly understood as a theological view that affirms the existence of God, but denies miraculous or supernatural occurrences in the natural world. Deists often compare God to a clockmaker. Just as a clockmaker creates a clock, winds it up and lets it operate, so too God created the world and then let it operate according to natural law. Deism places high importance on scientific theory, regards supernatural occurrences as impossible. In the deist view, God exists, but does not interact personally with the universe. Deism also places high value on human reason. Typically, typically, a deist would regard Bible stories containing miracles as little more than myths. This is uh, often the um, definition of deism that is most commonly used uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, opine against Freemasonry and uh, believing that somehow uh, Freemasonry has uh, inculcated uh, this type of religious philosophy into its thinking uh, and into its, uh, into its very lodges and its actions. 
Uh, I think most of us, if we thought through this particular uh, definition, would say uh, that is not the definition that I know of the religious philosophy of Freemasonry. Now, uh, we need to talk a little bit more about deism. Uh, so the next slide. Deism, as we know it, was a direct product of the Enlightenment. What was the Enlightenment? The Enlightenment was the 17th and 18th century intellectual movement that championed human reason and scientific thinking. The Enlightenment is closely tied to the scientific revolution of the 16th through 18th centuries. And as Europeans gained an understanding of modern science, they increasingly became skeptical of tradition, traditional religious teachings. Many intellectuals of the Enlightenment considered much of traditional Christianity and superstition. For example, how could Moses have parted a sea? How could Jesus have raised a man from the dead? That is contrary to science. These therefore must be myths. That is how many enlightenment intellectuals thought, yet they were not intellectually prepared to affirm atheism, the belief that God did not exist. Therefore, deism developed as a theological approach that affirmed God's existence, but denied supernatural occurrences. And not only supernatural occurrences, but any sense of communication with this uh, omnipotent uh, and omniscient being. Lord Edward Herbert of Sherbury has been called the father of English deism, and his writings form the basis of a progression, but less dogmatic start of this religious philosophy. His writings, along with others like John Locke, proved tremendously influential. Deism eventually would spread from England to other countries like France, Germany, and to the United States. Deism and America's founding fathers. Uh, it's important that maybe we acknowledge uh, the deism that was here in our own uh, country and the founding fathers uh, of our political country, but also uh, men that we under many men that we understood as great Mason. As children of the Enlightenment, many of America's founding fathers were deists. There is much debate among historians over which founding fathers were and were not deists. This is because many of the writings of our, our founders contain varying degrees of deistic thought. It is important to keep in mind that deistic thinking was often synthesized with Christianity, tended to and making it tending to be vague. So historians often disagree over who was an outright deist and who was a Christian with deist sympathies. That said, many of our founders were influenced by deist thinking to various degrees. Well, who were those people? Well, among them, certainly Thomas Jefferson, although he is not proven to be a Mason. And, uh, Thomas Jefferson was generally considered a deist. In fact, he was so skeptical of supernatural occurrences that he took a knife and cut out passages of the Bible that referred to miracles. Jefferson's Bible, as it's been called, is still around today. It's in the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, it is often used uh, to point at the radical nature of uh, Thomas Jefferson's understanding. Although he professed to be a Christian, um, and there were items of the Bible that he simply could not stomach, and so literally cut them out of his Bible, um, believing them uh, uh, beyond reason or pale. Benjamin Franklin was also widely believed to have been a deist in his early years. James Madison is thought to have been a deist, though there is much debate. A leading American deist was Thomas Paine. Uh, he certainly was not a Freemason, but he was the writer of The Age of Reason and Common Sense, uh, two of the most influential papers uh, to bring on the American Revolution. And we might ask the question about George Washington. Debate over his religious views has often been heated. The truth is that no one is really sure. Washington commonly referred to providence instead of God in his writings. Yet he is generally thought to have been an Episcopalian, although he eschewed taking Holy Communion and had not a, not a notable reproach by his parish priest for not taking Holy Communion. Um, those things you may or may not know, but they're commonly understood facts about his life. Um, so next week, uh, we, I've given you a little bit of the uh, what has led up to deism in terms of uh, 
uh, and the Enlightenment uh, and how it has been a flowering of the Enlightenment as a religious ideal. Uh, next week, I want to talk about uh, the religious philosophy of Freemasonry's founding fathers. We'll explore the religious philosophy of uh, John Theophilus de Galguer and uh, Reverend James Anderson, uh, two of the foremost founders of the modern era of Freemasonry. Uh, what was their religious perspectives? Uh, what was the intent of the influence, their influence, and what did they understand Freemasonry to be? and want it to be uh, based upon their uh, religious understanding and um, how they shaped the craft at that time. Now, um, I went through that rather quickly and I'm not sure that uh, uh, a lot of you are uh, <laughs> able to follow everything that went along, uh, but um, because this comes from a much longer paper, uh, nearly 28 pages actually, uh, but um, I, I, it's an introduction, and I felt this was the uh, way that we needed to begin. I'm going to um, go back here. Uh, let's see here. That's not what I want to do. Uh, no, that's not what I want to do. Um, let's go back so we can see each other here. Um, how do I stop sharing here? Uh, let's see, I'm sharing a screen, stop sharing. There we go, all right, there we go. Now we're back again. So uh, uh, my brothers, um, any questions that you have? Did what I share seem understandable to you? Is it fit with anything that you know about the development of our craft? Um, what, uh, what thoughts do you have? Uh, please feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself. You should be able to. I got to double check, make sure I didn't turn that off. But uh, yeah, you should be able to unmute yourself. So if you do have something, please go ahead and, and say, it. unmute yourself. I, I will start with it, Terry, that I thought that it was definitely understandable. And it, it drives me to, to do a little bit of my own research um, later on here as well, too. So yes, Terry, uh, John Freeberg here. Yeah, John. Yes, uh, yes, excellent talk, uh, and, it, and it was very understandable, so thank you for that. A question I have is, when did people start to identify with the word deist uh, in, in this country? When, when did people say, oh, I'm a deist? Uh, we can go back to uh, George, uh, probably Benjamin Franklin and his writings. Uh, he does use the word deist. Um, and uh, those writings go back into the 1740s, uh, actually, 17, uh, I won't say the 30s, but certainly the 1740s and 50s. Uh, when you take a look at some of his writings and uh, how pejorative they kind of uh, look at the world, uh, you have to say, well, he, he certainly had a sympathy with deism. Uh, now, that sympathy uh, did not carry through with him all his life. Uh, that was, the, I made the distinction of noting this was his early thought. And uh, according to my reading and understanding, I think that is a true statement. Now, I do not pretend to be a uh, Franklin scholar, although I, interestingly enough, have had conversations with a few of them, um, but not over that subject. <laughs> But uh, I would, I think uh, Benjamin Franklin is certainly one of the most long lived of the Masons, but he had a, an, a he had a, uh, a, you know, a means to share his thoughts and he was looked up to. And so that's part of the reason why we have so much of his writing. Uh, you know, he was a newspaper man, simple as that. Uh, well known, very distinguished, uh, and, um, you know, so we've got a lot of material to go to look at. Were there other people besides Franklin who declared themselves deists or was he kind oh, of yes. alone? Uh, yes, yes, there were. But uh, the ones I lifted up are kind of the more notable individuals. Uh, Jefferson, uh, I, I, I haven't done a lot of research on his writing, but there's no question that he was a deist. Um, you know, simply by how he 
looked at the rational world and, uh, you know, had a belief in God, but had no sense of belief in miracles of the miraculous or divine intervention. Uh, for our craft, as I'll mention later on, one of the distinctions that does not make a theist is by virtue of the fact that we open and close with prayers, and prayer uh, implies a sense of communication. And uh, so we, uh, if we didn't, if we were truly deist, uh, you've got to ask yourself, why would we even, uh, why would we even attempt to try to communicate with the, with the, with the creator? Uh, where's about Sean? You had, uh, had your hand up virtually. So I, I guess listening to the presentation and especially the point that you've just made, would it be a a good assumption or a good standing that when we cross the threshold of the lodge, we start to act or behave similar to deists while still maintaining our religious beliefs then because we're accepting individuals of all faiths? I would, I would argue that, um, I, I guess, I suppose you could say to the extent that deism uh, and Sherberg's uh, uh, five principal points that belief in God or supreme deity is the beginning uh, of, uh, of knowledge. And in Freemasonry, we would say that's true. And we certainly propound that without making a definition as to why or what, uh, what the creedal statements are related to that. I will argue next week that, that they were very specific as to why we do that and where it came from. But, um, uh, to ask yourself, is there more deism in masonry? I would argue no, but that when you take a look at the five classical points, I think you can look at every one of them and say, masonry believes that. We believe in moral character and our actions. Uh, every Grand Lodge, I, I won't say every, but I've studied a number of them, have as one of their major points of a landmark that uh, we believe in a God who punishes evil and, uh, and uh, pronounces good, and that there are uh, eternal consequences for that. Uh, in the Grand Lodge of Minnesota, that is the, I used to know which landmark it was, the uh, 17th or the 18th landmark at Grand Lodge of Minnesota. Hey Jason, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I, I can't, can't see the screen. I, what I've seen tonight seems like the people are trying to complicate things. In, in the purest essence, take away any definition you have to have. If you believe in a supreme being, you're a deist. It means that you don't have to believe in any theology that was created to try to explain what God is. And so, yes, all Masons have to be deists because we believe in a God. Uh, it doesn't mean, it doesn't preclude that you can find some of theology interesting. It's simply that you're saying God is a supreme being. Theology is a belief system created by human beings to try to understand God. And maybe we're just not smart enough. Maybe we just have to accept the fact that there's two options. There can be a God or there can't be a God. And you choose to look of, at everything around you and say, I don't think this could happen without having a supreme being. Uh, so, yeah, I think Masons all have to be deists, but we don't require them to believe in a certain theology. Thank you, uh, you, uh, you could argue that, Ed, but I think... Uh... There's a significant difference between the deism, as I say, in the early period and the deism in the late period. And the deism in the late period uh, is not embraced by Freemasonry. Uh, it simply doesn't, we, we simply are, well, as I indicated, just in one indication, just the fact that we have about prayers. Uh, hmm. Late deism uh, did not believe that God influenced anything. And that there was no communication with the, with the supreme being. Uh, that's that's part of the reason why it was uh, considered so antithetical to uh, a, a doctrinal Christianity. Uh, uh, it it simply uh, chose to say that Jesus could not have performed miracles. 
uh, that uh, he could not have been uh, the son of God and the son of man, uh, that uh, 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 what who we are and what we are is uh, God essentially uh, got the world started and, and uh, uh, it goes by a natural order. And uh, the more uh, we know scientifically, the more we understand of the natural order. Uh, uh, there's, no, there's no place for God in that kind of, uh, uh, really no place for God in that kind of deism. Hmm. When you add those appendages on to the word deism, you're actually creating a certain kind of theology. You're, it may be a counter theology, but it is a theology. Oh, I, oh, I, I, I don't deny that. But I, but I don't think that you can argue that Freemasonry does not have theological, uh, uh, religious, ph philosophical principles. I, 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 it, I, I it, can't it, argue. It, it has principles of morality, but these people say that if you're a deist, you can't communicate with that. That's in the latter period of, de, of Freemasonry, yes. yeah. of, deism, I, I, of deism, yeah. I think, the, I think deism is a belief in the supreme being and trying to interpret your own intellectual capabilities to understand it, as opposed to saying, I accept everything this religion says, that's theology. Uh, I think all religions have something to contribute, but I get, I'm not going to say that a certain religion has all the answers. Therefore, you can be a deist and not be a theist and still believe in God, still believe in yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. And I would, I'm, I'm going to argue that, in fact, uh, Freemasonry is not deism, but it's rational theism. And that'll be the end point that I'll make here in a couple more lectures. So basically, uh, we don't, we don't want to jump ahead too far. Well, you'll you'll find you'll you'll see how we get there. <laughs> okay, find this very interesting. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Ed. Um, um, hello, uh, can I, uh, Jason? Can I? Jump please in? go ahead. Okay. Please go ahead. Um, along the lines of what uh, just Ed uh, said, I'm curious, Terry. Um, the world obviously has embraced Freemasonry uh, in a in a multi-country-like fashion, right? So it's spread over the globe. And are, I'm wondering if uh, to hear your thoughts on how deism and the transformation into what I sometimes call a Christian Freemasonry in the United States, how that differs around the globe and how many are still adhering to a more deistic or as you earlier mentioned, a, uh, yeah. a practical deism. Yeah. When I was in Europe um, and talking with Masons over there, um, actually at the conference that I gave the outline for this paper, uh, there was an emphatic uh, sense by French Masons that there could be no question that we are deist. Uh, now, I never got into enough discussions to ask them, you know, what, what element of deism do they see that, that makes them believe that they can fashion Freemasonry as having that moniker? And uh, of course, in France, uh, we can talk about the, uh, uh, the Grand Orient of France, and uh, which in 1885 essentially put a, a blank book on the altar and said, uh, you bring your uh, beliefs to it and your conscience and let that be your guide. Um, I, I think that's the radical sense of deism, but that is not how I understand Freemasonry, at least in any regular sense of Freemasonry. Uh, we have, a, we have a, 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 uh, a Bible or a volume of sacred law, uh, which we believe uh, gives light and teaching to uh, the moral principles and uh, uh, gives us guidance and uh, is not antithetical to the natural world but simply allows us to say that the natural world has not been created by itself, but is uh, subject to a, a, uh, a creation by a deity that is larger than anything we can conceive. And uh, the natural laws, uh, and certainly Freemasonry, uh, 
know, our, our, our several, our several sciences, uh, everything that we teach in the second degree is related to the fact that we believe that uh, these uh, sciences, these arts are uh, simply the natural working out of God-given abilities and talent and awareness that God has given us. And we celebrate that. But we are not the creator. We are the creation. And there's always that distinction. So that's the way I look at it. But um, quite frankly, one of the questions I had to ask myself, and I'll, I'll mention this next week, uh, I had a very serious question asking, you know, do I want to be a part of Freemasonry that has uh, an altar and a Bible on it and has prayers to God, uh, but does not lift up Jesus, uh, does not uh, seem to have a Christian orientation, although uh, there are certainly elements of the faith of, of Freemasonry as it's practiced in some places that do. And to what extent could I assent to the teachings of Freemasonry and the governance of Freemasonry and make oaths and vows that had any sense of meaning? And uh, I'll explain how I got past that next week. Yeah, may I make a comment, Worshipful Brother Terry? Sure. So I, I think you bring up an important point. And one of the things we have to remember historically is that early Freemasonry, if you look at like the Grand Manuscript or uh, what the ancients wrote, uh, uh, Heman Raison, or any of the very early Grand Lodge things, it was in fact very Christian and Jesus was mentioned on a regular basis. And it wasn't until, as far as I can tell from my research, and I could be wrong, feel free to correct me. It wasn't until the uh, reunification of the ancients and the moderns that a lot of the overt, overtly yeah. Christian things, and especially the mention of Jesus, yeah. was removed from, yeah. from the uh, ritual. Yeah. We have a, a prayer that's used in the uh, first degree that if you read the original specifically mentions Jesus and now is about as generic as you can get. And so it, near as I can tell, that's when that started to really. Well, that's when it was, that was, that's when it was put in, into doctrine that was adopted uh, in terms of what yeah. we know as regular Freemasonry today. But uh, uh, was that the intent of the founders to have uh, uh, these Christian illusions in the craft? And uh, I'll argue that, in fact, uh, our original founders, although they were very much Christians, saw Freemasonry uh, as having a different purpose, uh, a, a, a uniting purpose, which had to transcend religious sectarianism. And, uh, and I think I can prove that uh, next week, as I say, rather significantly. Very good. Uh, I'm I'm looking forward to next week. You mentioned, uh, most worshipful, that you this will be published as a paper. Can you? Uh, well, uh, the, the the paper is will be published by Ars Quadra Coronati, which is the premier uh, oh. educational group uh, of the world, uh, with uh, the lodge in England. Uh, they uh, will not publish papers that have been published anyplace else, uh, as is true of many uh, societies. But I was specifically asked to um, edit my paper with uh, some of their corrections, some of their needs, and uh, give it to them. And uh, they, it, they will publish it, uh, at least uh, the anticipation is they'll publish it in the next issue in 22. Now, I gave the paper that I gave was in July of 19. And quite frankly, I was not uh, overly excited about going back and re-editing it to their needs. <laughs> it's a, I put in I put in a couple of hundred hours doing the paper to begin with. I really was kind of tired of looking at it. <laughs> but but uh, it is a it is a distinct it is a very distinct honor to be asked to submit a paper by them. And uh, if I, I I have no if I'm going to if if I'm not going to pass up this opportunity, it has to be done now because you're not going to be asked again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would remind everybody that you can all join the Quattro Coronati Correspondence Circle, yeah, which is what they have for those of us that can't get to England for the meetings on a regular basis. Uh, and then you get that book. 
That's right. Then you get the, the that's end part of, of that's part of your money, and it's not that expensive, and you get all kinds of other good things and and so on. And it, it, why look, ah. Brother Adam has one there. <laughs> well, and, I, have, uh, I have the whole series. It took me a while to eventually get them all, but uh, I caught yeah, them it, it, and it really is just the absolute premier writing. It, yeah. it's certainly, um, what do I want to say? Uh, biased towards the. British outlook. British, yes, yes, it, it is biased, and that's part of the reason why there are not very many North American writers that <laughs> get invited to to present something. Yeah, uh, but and nonetheless, quite frankly, and, and quite frankly, if I had not been in Europe to present this paper, it would never have been looked at. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? Lodger in there. I mean, wow, talk about a, uh, you know, that's that's quite the feather in your cap. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm delighted that I was asked, and uh, I also went to represent the Philolathe Society, which is the premier education society in America. So, <laughs> which we are also taking uh, subscriptions for, if you'd like. Absol to ab absolutely, it's actually yes. cheaper than Quattro Coronati, it, it and is our beard is good. The quarterly magazine is is really fantastic. So, yeah, awesome. yeah. Yeah, guys, yeah, well, a good, a good, a good, plug, a good, a good, a good plug. We'll uh, we'll give you three thumbs up there. <laughs> three <laughs> thumbs up for the plug. All right. Um, any anybody else got a question before I um, pass it off to the to the big guy here? Yeah, maybe uh, put the maybe, maybe ahead, one, one follow up question uh, in regards to the discussion that took place. But as we stand right now, <clears throat> we're just kind of the limited knowledge in around what you're going to present uh, subsequently, uh, Russell Butter. Um, if I would ask you, um, would you consider a DS a Freemason? What would be your answer? Uh, uh, yeah, the, my uh, <laughs> that's an interesting <laughs> question. Uh, if, if, uh, it depends. There's a part of me that says uh, Freemasonry is a brotherhood which unites uh, persons of all uh, faiths and creeds where there is only a single modifier, which is, do you have a belief in a supreme being? Now, um, I, our early fathers, and I'll, I'll argue this next week, uh, actually argued that deists were not appropriate members of the fraternity and actually spoke out against deism. But this was the radical deism of the latter portions, not the deism that I've introduced to you of Sherberg. Um, that was a developed deism that was antithetical to the church, antithetical to uh, religious authority, uh, antithetical to um, uh, you know any any sense of uh, of um, divine intervention in life, uh, and that uh, that that is that certainly is not the deism that uh, not only masonry doesn't practice, but that is a deism that uh, was rabid. Uh, that was the deism of Thomas Paine. Um, Thomas Paine was very influential in America, but uh, he was also exceedingly radical to the place where, um, and he came to America relatively just years before the start of the revolution. And, uh, but his, his, he had a significant influence, but a tremendous amount of fervor. Uh, the, the, uh, the Puritan churches, uh, Presbyterian churches, you go right down the line of the major churches, congregational churches, in America, virtually panned him and simply said, you, you should not listen to this man. This man is an atheist and uh, does not represent the best ideals of America. Well, his teaching was very influential in terms of the revolution and inspiring, uh, inspiring the, the revolution, no question about it. But uh, the churches radically panned him, uh, just, just broadside after broadside. Um, uh, and he was unrepentant in his thinking. I mean, there were, he never changed his attitude, never changed it. Uh, that was the radical deism. So you ask the question, would I, would I accept a deist? I, I would very much like to ask that person, tell me what you believe. 
but sometimes we don't have that opportunity. And most of our brothers, quite frankly, uh, you know, what's the question? What's the first question we ask? Do you have a belief in a supreme being? Uh, we don't ask. We don't ask them to interpret it. We don't ask them to give us details. Oh, by the way, what denomination do you believe it through? We don't ask that question. Uh, so we take it. We take them at their word. And uh, I, I have to. I have to leave it. I have to begin there and end there as well. I guess. Now there are some questions as to whether a Buddhist, for example, can be a Mason. Uh, Buddhism has no belief in God. It's a philosophy, not a, not a religious belief in God. But uh, we have many Buddhists uh, that, are, that are Masons, more especially in the Middle East. So you can get into all kinds of distinctions if you want to. Uh, quite frankly, those distinctions tear us apart. Right. I, I, I would prefer to ask uh, my brother, show me what you believe by what you do. Does, does, does Freemasonry not ask that question most significantly? I would argue it does. Most crucial, if, if, you, if you're using that as a criteria, there are, there are people who are devout members of a religion that do horrible things. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there are people that are not member of any religious that do, that do, good, that do, that do great things. So. That do great, great things. But we still have the, 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 the one principle, the first question that has to be asked. Do you have a belief in a supreme being? That has to be That's answered. That's theism. That's theism, right? Absolutely. I would argue that, in fact, Freemasonry is rationalistic theism, not theism. I'll come to that conclusion in another two lectures. <laughs> well, thank you, most worshipful. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to the Grand Master for Minnesota. Uh, Rolf, you, want, you have any anything that you want to add to the conversation before we wrap it all up? Hey, you may want to unmute yourself first, though. Yes, I was trying to, but the space bar didn't do it. <laughs> First, most worshipable brother, Terry, thank you for an excellent presentation. And I'm looking forward to the next one and the next one and many more after that. <laughs> to the uh, committees for putting these on and continuing to do that since Masonry says knowledge is, is what we're after. I think it's very good that we can still continue to have these on Wednesday nights. And I appreciate that. And to all that have uh, attended, good to see all of you. And I hope you bring your friends. Absolutely. Thank you, Most Worshipful. Uh, with that, we're going to call it an evening or top of the hour. So thank you for all attending. <laughs>